So morning, everybody. Um, so my name is Helen uh, Sneef. I'm one of the trainee consultant scientists um, in uh, neurophysiology here at QMC. Um, you've asked me to come uh, this morning and talk to you a little bit more about CFAM monitoring. So thank you very much. Um, so we are going to be looking at neurophysiological monitoring on the ICU. So we're going to look at some brain waves, um, look at how that shows in, in some trends. Um, and we're also going to touch on some artifacts. So those signals that we don't want to be seeing um, when we're recording um, our CFAM. So the learning outcomes for today, I'm going to explain differentiate and justify the use of a uh, routine EG uh, when compared to CFAM or what is more commonly referred to as continuous uh, EEG monitoring. Also going to classify the CFAM into uh, main trends. So there's four main trends. Uh, there's continuous burst suppression, um, that we'll touch on uh, later on, uh, total suppression and seizures, which is actually the main reason that we come and do CFAM monitoring on the unit for you. I'm going to apply that knowledge of those four main trends to look at some patient examples and we're going to identify and try and work out what is um, brain activity, cerebral activity from these common artifacts that we see. So unwanted signals that might be electrical interference, um, it might be uh, physio, suctioning, that kind of thing. So let's talk about the difference between EEG, CFAM and continuous EEG. Um, because the, the terms are sort of banded around a lot, so we just need to work out what the difference is between them. So EEG, that stands for electroencephalography. And if you think of when you're recording an ECG on the unit, you're recording the electrical activity of the heart, and that's in the order, the voltages are, you're recording in millivolts. So when we're recording the EEG, we're recording the electrical activity of the brain. And that signal is a lot smaller. So that's in the order of microvolts. So a thousand times smaller than any recording that you're going to get from the heart. When we come and do um, a routine EEG on the unit, we record for um, about 20 or 30 minutes. And that's the difference between EEG and CFAM. So CFAM is, is a cerebral function analysing monitor. And that term actually goes back to the 1960s when uh, there were a couple of people that realised that they needed to record EEG activity, but over a long period of time. So they designed a machine that would show you trended activity rather than just the raw EEG waveforms. Um, so we we still stick to um, to that terminology. So we still call our monitoring CFAM monitoring. Now, if you were to Google um, papers and extra information on CFAM, not a great deal would come up because now the term that is used is continuous EEG. And so those two terms, they're sort of the same. Most of the time when continuous EEG is done, it's, I mean, it's mainly done in the US, to be fair. And when they do it, they record a huge number of channels um, and trended information. Whereas when we do our CFAM monitoring, we, we're just doing two channels, but the two, the two are interchangeable to a certain extent. And um, so let's talk about EEG and CFAM. So a routine EEG, this is um, what you would see on the screen. I'm not sure how many of you have actually um, been on the unit and been on when we've recorded a routine EEG. This is the sort of data that we're looking at. So this is just a screenshot of just a page of 
EEG. So I'm hoping that you can see these green vertical lines going down the screen. So these are one second intervals. So this page um, has got 13 seconds of EEG. We've got 16 channels of brain activity and under this yellow bar down at the bottom there would be an ECG trace um, as well, just a lead one. Now, I'm sure you can appreciate that there is a huge amount of data on this screen and that's only 13 seconds. So if we want to record brain activity over a long period of time, then the data that we're going to generate over 48 hours is just huge. So let's compare that to CFAM. So here, we've got a screenshot of a page of CFAM monitoring. So you can see it looks very different. We've still got our raw EEG up here at the top. There are two channels um, recording from the right side of the brain and recording from the left side of the brain. And although this um, period of raw EEG is about 10 seconds or so, the trend of information that it gives us down here at the bottom is over a longer period of time. So we've got about three hours worth of information um, on this screen and it's split it up into the frequencies of um, signals that we're seeing in this DSA, this density spectral array, which is um, like a, a colour graph of what the EEG is showing. And then we've also got amplitude EEG. And if any of you have spent time on the neonatal unit, um, they record CFAM, uh, CFAM monitoring. They just, I think they just do a one channel, but it's amplitude EEG that they record. So we're looking at the size of the signal. So there is a lot of variability with CFAM monitoring, not only in the UK, but also worldwide. And there is debate as to the types of patients to monitor, so who to monitor, the number of channels and the number of electrodes that might be used. So um, I was saying in the US, um, they use a full head of electrodes and really go into town on it but then they have got the resources to be able to do that. And there's a lot of variability between the availability of monitoring and who interprets it. Um, so we are one of the few departments in the UK that actually does CFAM, continuous EEG monitoring. We are the only one, as far as I'm aware, that offers um, an emergency CFAM service overnight. There are other departments around that do limited, uh, a limited full head of electrodes, but but most departments aren't doing like a full EG's worth um, of electrodes on the head. So in Nottingham, I've just said, um, we do this as an emergency on call out of hours. Um, the two channels that um, that I'm talking about are just from the left and the right side of the head. So um, if you can see this diagram here, uh, this is a picture of the head looking down from above. So we've got the nose at the front and ears either side. And these dots are where we've got our electrodes placed. So when we do our recording, we're recording a wide spaced uh, montage on the left and wide spaced on the right. So it's a simplified um, version of an EEG. So who do we use uh, CFAM for? So it's recommended for seizures. There isn't any actually any guidance on CFAM monitoring available. Because of that huge variability um, that we talked about on the last slide, the American Clinical Neurophysiology Society uh, back in 2015 got as far as forming a consensus statement. So not a guideline, but more a, a consensus, a feeling of what you should be using CFAM for. Um, so it was recommended to be used for seizures. In the diagnosis of non-convulsive seizures, non-convulsive status epilepticus, 
and those other paroxysmal events um, and what it means by that is those events that then you're not quite sure what's happening so an example would be you know the heart rates going up the blood pressures dropping you can't work out why that might be so so CFAM might be used if those events were quite sporadic and you weren't going to catch them on an EEG. Uh, CFAM is also used to uh, guide the therapy for patients with seizures and status um, so you could use the CFAM to see how effective the uh, anti-seizure medications were. Now it's only suggested, not recommended, to use the CFAM to titrate the depth of anaesthesia. So um, occasions where you have a head injured patient and you want to neuroprotect them and put them into a really deep state of anaesthesia to protect the brain, reduce the metabolic demand. Um, so you could use the CFAM to get that patient into that deep state of anaesthesia, into a pattern that we call burst suppression. So we'll show a slide of that um, shortly, but that's only a suggestion. So you might say, well, why do we want to monitor for seizures? Surely, you know, if a patient is clinically seizing, you don't need a monitor to, to tell you that they're having a seizure. So yes, seizures can be clinical, so you can have that visible twitching, jerking of the body. But equally, seizures can be subclinical, or the term that is used um, now is non-convulsive seizures. And those are patients that are either having very subtle clinical signs, so it might just be a tiny bit of facial twitching, maybe only um, some subtle eye movements, so nystagmus, or there might not be any signs at all, any clinical signs that the patient is having a seizure. The only way of um, finding that out is to record EEG or uh, record a CFAM in those instances. Now, this is, this is an adult percentage, but it's been shown that non-convulsive seizures occur in about 8 to 48 percent of um, the critically ill. Now that's quite a broad percentage um, and it depends on the etiology so it depends what has caused the seizure whether it's somebody with a, a subarachnoid hemorrhage, a traumatic brain injury, infection and um, that high percentage that 48 percent relates to someone who's come in after a generalised convulsive status epilepticus. So they are more likely to then go on to have these non-convulsive seizures that you can't see as well. So what are the limitations of CFAM monitoring? Now, it's not necessarily better than a standard EEG. There's common thinking that, well, CFAM must be better because it records for a longer period of time. Um, but the limitations of that are that it is only a two channel recording and it's largely affected, hugely affected by muscle and movement. Now, you'll still get a muscle and movement on a full EEG, but when you've only got two channels to look at, it makes it impossible to interpret. You might have trouble with focal seizures as well. So because of this two channel quite gross pattern, anything that's very focal, very isolated, you might not capture that on just one channel on each side of the head. And it's important to state here that although the CFAM is good because it gives you trended information, you shouldn't be using that trend in isolation. So um, you always need to review the raw EEG if there are any changes in the trend that are suspicious. CFAM is great if you've got a patient with a nice normal background and they have seizures or events arising out of that because you will see the change in the trend. The problem is, is if you have a patient who is continuously in one state. So if you had a patient who's 
background EEG was continuously abnormal and the CFAM was continuously abnormal, you've got a steady state, if you like, of abnormality. So you're not going to see those changes in the trend. So that can make it um, quite difficult to see. Um, and again, you'd need the raw EEG just to see actually what is happening in the brain. Now, we run the CFAM service. It's physiologist and scientist led. Um, we don't have any consultant input into it. So there may be occasions where we come and apply the CFAM, but we feel that the findings and what we're seeing is way beyond um, what we would be happy to report. So there will be occasions where we will advise a routine EEG um, based on what we're seeing on the CFAM. And actually, even if you refer for a CFAM and we look at the referral, there might be clues on that referral where we think, well, actually, we think an EEG would be um, a better choice of test in this instance. For example, if you've got a patient who's just twitching and jerking all the time, you'd be better off having a full EEG because you know that you're going to capture the event in 20 or 30 minutes and you've got more electrodes on the head. So it's going to be easier to uh, localise any abnormalities. So just think about, I mean, this is aimed more at the medics, really. So, you know, they should be look, thinking about what they really need. So if you can get the answer from an EEG, I would always say use an EEG. More for adults, you know, if they were twitching on a sedation hold, then great, let's come and do the EEG when you're doing a sedation hold and then we can record the event. Patients who've been off sedation for 72 hours and they're not waking up, query seizures. Again, you're going to need an EEG. A, because they're in that state all the time, so you'll capture the event as such. And if they've been off sedation for 72 hours, they're probably going to be maybe muscly, maybe a little bit of movement. So a CFAM is not going to be um, appropriate in those instances. Titrating to birth suppression. Yes, a CFAM. I've put in brackets at the moment um, because I'm about to um, start a research project um, using a, a device, a depth of anaesthesia monitor that they use in theatre that actually um, answers that question. So it might be longer term that something like a BIS monitor or a Narcotrend might actually be used to guide the patient into a birth suppression pattern. Let's uh, move on to some wiggly lines. When we talk about EEG and when we come up and monitor CFAM, we'll often use the terms frequency and amplitude. So I'm going to take you back to your GCSE physics um, and just remind you what we actually mean when we're talking about a frequency and amplitude, because we use these phrases all the time. Um, and it's, it's easy to forget that not everybody is up to speed with the terminology that we're using. We have got um, a run of EEG activity. We've got our vertical one second intervals. So frequency is the number of waves that you'd see in a second. So here we've got 10 waves in one second and frequency is measured in hertz. So 10 waves in one second is 10 hertz activity. So that's our frequency. When we're talking about amplitude, we're talking about the voltage. So sort of top to bottom of the activity that we see on the screen. We mentioned earlier on that that's recorded in um, microvolts. Now, when we are recording seizures and epileptical activity on the CFAM and the EEG, what are we actually looking for? What are the waveforms that we see? So you'll hear us talking about spikes and sharps or spike and wave. The difference between spikes and sharps is how pointed it is. So if we just hover over um, this top trays, when we talk about spike and wave, we're talking about spike and a wave spike so that's your spike and wave activity sharp and wave activity is the same so sharp and a wave sharp 
and a wave. But the difference between a spike and wave is, is the duration of this, of this sharp spiky component. Um, so if this is a lot narrower and more pointed at the top, it's a spike as seen here. This is a sharp wave, but you can see, I mean, it's still sharp. You, just, you still wouldn't want to poke your finger on the top of it, but it's not quite as spiky as the um, that blue trace up here. So that's the sort of activity that we're looking for. Now, in very young patients, you often don't see this, this beautiful kind of spikiness. Sometimes it can just be more subtle rhythmic activity um, building up, um, which can be quite difficult to interpret on the CFAM. So this is more of your kind of your classic textbook activity that you would tend to see. Um, but we can see some, some brief recordings um, later on through the presentation. So, uh, one of the first slides um, that I showed was showing you a picture of the sea fan, like what um, a screenshot would look like. Um, and you've got raw EEG in the top window, so right side of the brain and left side of the brain. And then I said there was this colourful graph, this frequency plot, and then this trend of amplitude, so the size of the signal. Um, and I just wanted to briefly show you how, how that happens. So the CFAM looks at a period of time and in that sort of, I don't know, let's take a four second period, it will think, well, what amplitudes have I got in this four seconds? So obviously there's going to be a bit of a variation. So you're going to have some signals that are quite low amplitude, so maybe 10 microvolts, some amplitudes that are going to be a lot taller, a lot bigger, so maybe 20 microvolts. So it will plot those two differences on this logarithmic scale. So it will plot kind of the smallest, the lowest amplitude at 10 and the highest at 20 and we'll sort of do a little bar. Then the next period of time, it will look again, what amplitudes have I got? And it might see that the lowest amplitudes are actually kind of more in the order of seven or eight microvolts. And the highest amplitude stuff in that window of four seconds was perhaps more 30 microvolts. And what it does is kind of each epoch of time, it will build up this range of amplitudes. And this is what we're seeing in our trend over a long period of time. So let's move on to our four main trends. So our first trend is continuous. So if you or I were hooked up to this now, this is probably what it would show. So just to orientate you around the slide, raw EG at the top, recording the top traces from the right side of the brain, bottom traces from the left side. We've got our green vertical lines, one second intervals. We've got our frequency, colourful plot here, right and left. And we've got our amplitude logarithmic plot below, again, right and left side of the brain. This trace, when it's nice and continuous, the difference between the lowest amplitude signals and the highest amplitude signals actually isn't that great. Because there's not a massive difference between those two, we get quite a narrow band when we're doing the recording. And actually, that's really, really nice and steady. So if we compare that to another trend that we might see called birth suppression, you can see that there is a huge difference between the size of the signals. So you've got some amplitude signals which are very low in amplitude, almost flat. So let's just say that that's I don't know, one microvolt. But then you've also got periods of activity in the bursts that are a lot higher in amplitude. So because you've got that bigger range, that bigger distance, you've got a wider band. So it's plotting the lowest amplitude signals, which are really, really tiny, so almost on the baseline, and then plotting the highest amplitude signals up here. 
So because of the bigger difference, you get a wider band. And this is the sort of pattern that you would see in a patient who was um, deeply sedated. So you'd go from this continuous activity and if you gave somebody sedation, you might start to see periods where this activity was dropping down in amplitude, going flatter and then sort of coming back up again. And you would get to a stage where you would have these bursts of activity followed by these periods of flattening, periods of suppression, bursts of activity and periods of suppression. If the sedation was to deepen any more, then you would lose all of the electrical activity and you would get complete suppression. That's actually what we're going to show in this slide. We have got a red vertical line here, which relates to this vertical line here. Again, we've got a period of about three hours um, on this trend from left to right. So you can see at the start of the recording, um, you've got this wide band. So it looks like the patient was in a burst suppression pattern. But here, something has changed on the trend. You've got this sudden drop to complete suppression. And what happened was this patient had a head injury. ICP was just out of control. And so at this point, a bolus of sedation was given, uh, which acted very quickly, knocked out all of the activity. So you're already in burst suppression. You add even more sedation. You will knock out all of the bursts. You get a period of complete suppression. And then as that bolus of sedation wears off, you'll see that you're starting to get some bursts coming back through into the trend until you're back into, and you can just see on this far right side, and um, that you're back to the burst suppression pattern that you saw at the start of the recording. If we move on to uh, seizures, so the main reason that we come up and do uh, monitoring for you on the unit. So you can see this is, um, you get a nice frilly pattern with seizures. So if we just look at the raw trace to begin with, so you can see that this right, this red channel is full of sharp, spiky activity. We're right in the middle of a seizure here. It's affecting the right side more than the left. And if we look at the trend, you can see that we've got our red vertical line here. So uh, this is right at the start of the seizure. Now, what happens in a seizure is the electrical activity of your brain changes. Generally, you will get an increase in amplitude so you can see where the trace was its baseline here and in the seizure the amplitude has gone up and there's also a change in the frequency so a change in the um the activity that we're seeing so um how many waves per second and you can see that that's reflected um, in our frequency plot here and actually, I mean, this is a beautiful textbook example of seizures, but you can see they almost look like little flames that are coming up from the baseline. So in between, you can see that the trace is pretty much continuous, but each of these deflections up from the amplitude plot that's in time with changes in the frequency, these are all individual seizures. So this patient, um, is of having repetitive seizures. Um, I'm not going to count how many are on that page, but that is again about a three hour window, so quite a few. Now, it's always very difficult just from a screenshot to um, give you a flavour of what the CFAM actually does. We will talk about the evolution of a seizure. And when we say evolution, we mean that the seizure will build up over time. Uh, this is playing through. You'll see um, a change in this rural EG. Can you see how it's evolving over time? 
Um, the waveforms are changing. So that was, um, so we're about to start another seizure here, look. So I'll give you a quick running commentary on what's happening. So you can see here, we're getting a build up, faster activity, moving over to the right side as well, higher in amplitude as you reach the peak of the seizure, then it starts to die back down again and then disappears. So this is a different example. This is um, another example of a patient in a seizure. The, there is no amplitude EEG for some reason on this recording, but we can see our DSA. Um, and these are our flames. Now they look um, quite wide, they're quite dispersed because the time um, scale on this recording is only about 20 minutes. So that's why it's kind of all spread out. Um, but hopefully we'll see this first seizure coming up here. Then this second seizure, there's a bit more, um, there's a bit more to this flame. So we're probably going to see this to be a more marked seizure, but we'll just play it through um, and see what happens. Okay. So we're coming into the seizure. It's mainly on this left side, this bottom side. You see those sharp waves that did build up. <laughs> they were quite subtle. It's going to come and hit this flame again. So sharp waves just starting to build. Can you see it gets really sharp and spiky, higher in amplitude, then stops suddenly. Then we've got another brief one coming up. Blink and you'll miss it. Just getting a little bit sharp here, just on this left side again. And then gone. And then I think there might be one more. Again, starting to build up. You've also got spread to the right hemisphere on this occasion. Can you see how you've got that lovely evolution? So it doesn't just go, it doesn't just start and stay the same it changes as it goes through the seizure. Now, there are very rare occasions where we've recorded a raised ICP that has actually had an impact on what we've recorded um, on the CFAM. This is a really old slide um, because I've only seen it on this one occasion. So occasionally when you get raised ICP, um, you see changes in higher amplitude, slow activity. And this actually was recorded um, on PICU uh, 2011, look, so it was a long time ago. So with the increases in raised ICP, you were getting increases in higher amplitude, slow activity. Now, because the recording is getting higher in amplitude, we were getting periods where, and it's a bit difficult to see, but you can sort of see a bit of a frilly pattern here. So these were increases in amplitude and the increases in amplitude were due to these increases in slow activity. And you can see at first glance, you might go, oh, that's a frilly pattern. That is um, a seizure. And actually, if I superimpose this seizure um, onto this trace. It does look very, very similar, but this is one of those cases where you need to highlight that just looking at the trend isn't enough. You need to look at the raw EEG to see actually what was it showing at the time. Um, there was no epileptiform activity um, in this patient at all. This trend was going up and, uh, and looking like a seizure simply because we were getting increases in size of the slow waves that were adding to the amplitude. So that's something to bear in mind. So we've looked at um, recordings and trends that have an upward deviation during seizures. Sadly, there are occasions uh, where we see um, downward trends. Um, and this is um, an example of a patient um, who coned. So um, they had a brain herniation. So at the start of the recording, I mean, it, 
it was a continuous pattern. It was fairly low amplitude. This narrow band is sitting a little bit lower um, than where we would expect it to be, particularly on this right side. It sits a little bit higher up on the left. But you can see over time, there's just this worrying decline in amplitude of the recording until it hits, hits rock bottom, which is where we've got our vertical marker here. So this point in time is where this raw EEG is here. Now, I know that you can see some rhythmical activity and you might say, oh, you know, there's, there's still brain activity there. But actually, all this is picking up is pulse artifact. And we've proved that by putting um, an ECG trace on here. So this trend doesn't sink right down to zero amplitude because it's just picking up this pulse artifact, which is adding to the amplitude. So if ever you see um, a recording that's doing this sort of huge decline down and there's no reason for it, you know, there's not been any change in station and it is a patient with you know, traumatic brain injury and their ICP has been going up a lot, um, then it's important just to uh, just to kind of note that. I know I said at the start, you know, we're, we're not making you into experts in CFAM, but you sort of act as our first responders in a way, because when we come up and do our CFAM monitoring, we only come up twice a day. We review all of the uh, recording that's happened in that time, but you are sitting by the patient. And I know you've got a thousand and one things to do, but just a glance at the CFAM every now and again, just to see, you know, has anything changed on that trend is really useful and very important. So I've brought this um, slide up. Um, I haven't actually said what it is on this slide yet because I just wanted us to have um, a little think about what it might be. So if you look at the raw EEG here, we've got um, it actually positioned where it's sort of nice and continuous, but before you have this upward deviation. So um, we've talked about the trend going up when there's a seizure, and that's that's what this does. Um, it starts quite sharply, but then it just sort of tails off. So could this be a seizure? You know, seizures can start suddenly, and then you know they can evolve, and this can start to drop down in amplitude, but. That is over quite a long period of time. So that looks like it starts, if we take this one, it starts about, I don't know, 8.52, something like that. And it goes on till like, you know, 9.18. I mean, that's half an hour. That would be unusual for just a single seizure. Um, and if we look at the trend here, this, um, this spectral array, this frequency, you haven't really got the flame that you would expect. You've almost kind of got like a block of brightness um, at around about, let me just track this back along here, around about 15 hertz. So you've got sort of like a, a you know, you haven't got the brightness kind of running all the way through it. It's just a block of it at about 15 hertz. And um, so it might be seizure. But it's important to look at the raw EEG right in the middle of the event. So that's where we are now. So you can see I've just moved the marker along a little bit. And can you see there's a massive difference between the raw EEG here and if I go back, that's what it was before. And in the event, that's what it's like. Um, and you can see actually, um, that there is a lot of this faster frequency, probably about 15 hertz activity um, in one second. Um, and what's happened, you can see at the top that it's midazolam. So uh, midazolam is a benzodiazepine and benzodiazepines have the effect on the EEG of increasing fast activity, at sort of fairly low doses. So what has happened on each of these occasions where the trend has gone up 
is that a bolus of midazolam has been given. So it's been given, so fast acting, get changes quite quickly, and then um, it's gradually worn off. And then another bolus is being given here, gradually wears off. So that's an example of what some medications can do to the CFAM. So let's look at examples of waveforms that we don't want to see on our CFAM. So I talked about muscle and movement, which is the enemy of any CFAM recording because it makes it completely uninterpretable, which is why we always, we always ask for patients to be sedated uh, when they're on CFAM. So if we just look at the trend to begin with, um, you can see it's, um, it's fairly narrow, it's nice and continuous. You've got a couple of periods towards this right side where the trend's gone up and then back down again. Um, again, here you've got a um, trend here where you've got this sudden upward deflection and an upward deflection again here. So, you know, is it a seizure? I'm not quite sure. That frequency spectral array. Um, it doesn't look like a flame coming up from the bottom. It almost looks like kind of something coming down. Um, and what it is, is muscle activity. So not muscly at the start of this window, but all this really fast frequency fizzy stuff that's sitting on top of our brain activity is muscle. And actually, I mean, that's that's fairly... Mind. You can see some of the slower waves underneath, but actually towards this side here, I mean, who knows what brain activity is sitting under that? Um, and because muscle activity is a lot higher in amplitude than any brain activity that we might see, this is why it's causing an upward deflection on the amplitude trend, because you're getting a sudden increase in the size of the signal. This machine isn't clever enough to work out what is muscle and what is brain activity. All it does is it looks for high amplitude signals, low amplitude signals. It's just compare, it's just looking at the size. And um, so it won't differentiate um, any muscle activity that it's seeing. So um, that's why, again, in, I'm keep banging on about this. It's important to, when you see a change on the trend, to actually refer to the raw EEG. Um, and in this situation, um, it was the muscle activity that was adding to it. So not a seizure. This is a patient who was coughing. Um, again, you've got a nice steady trend, sudden upward deflection. So we will refer to our raw EEG. Um, this patient was actually, they were starting to lighten them and she was starting to cough. Actually looking at that raw EEG, it almost looks like a seizure. So you've got, you know, like these sharp waves that start off sort of quite fast and then they just sort of start to peter out um, as time goes on. The other important thing that I haven't mentioned at all as we're doing this CFAM presentation is that and you probably know, is that the CFAM comes with video. And this is vital for us to help work out events, you know, sort of what they are generally, and also to try and time lock events as well. So on the video, what was causing this sharpened activity was actually the patient moving their head. So with each cough, they would knock their head forward and you would get this this is an artifact, this sharp wave. It's just movement on the electrodes with each cough. And you know what it's like when you start coughing, you know, you, you sort of do the odd cough and then you kind of have a bit of a fren frenzy of coughing and then your coughing sort of dies back down again. Um, and we were actually, the, were actually able to see that um, from the video. That's what was happening. You can see there is a little bit of muscle activity superimposed on it as well. Not enough for it to completely make the CFAM uninterpretable, um, but uh, but you can see um, she was clearly waking up. So this is my favourite slide out of the whole presentation. Um, it's a bit messy. There looks like there's something wrong with the DSA. Um, there's like a weird blue artefact line coming through it. Um, 
The amplitude trend is kind of, it's a bit messy. It's wider in places, the suppression, and it gets a little bit narrower here. But there is um, a period in the middle of this screen where there's a faint red line. I'm hoping that you can still see me moving um, this mark, this, um, my mouse. There's a little area just around here where the CPAM just sort of pinches together and it gets super narrow and there's a slight upward deflection. Um, and that is at this point here. There is, if you look at the raw EG, there are some very subtle spiky sharp waves that are sitting on top of um, this right side. Um, it might just be a bit of ECG coming through, um, just like the QRS complex, because it's, you know, we were talking about it being so much higher in amplitude than any brain activity. So sometimes we pick it up. Um, I'm just going to play this through. So. You can see as it starts to come through. That there. On this right side, there is some kind of almost like spike and wave activity, like spike and a wave, spike and a wave, spike and a wave. Looks very suspicious. Looks like it could be a seizure. I mean, that's the giveaway, <laughs> the annotation on it. And this is actually an example of physio. So they start off percussing the chest quite vigorously. And that tapping and the movement and the artifact that it generates looks like spike and wave. Here, less vigorous. So the percussing of the chest is less severe, so you get less artifact. But it almost looks like a seizure evolving and then dying down. So a great example um, of an artifact and how we worked out that that wasn't a seizure was by looking at the morphology because the this kind of the slow wave part of that potential spike and wave was just a little bit flatter. We were able to view the video, so that helped us work out that there was cares or something was happening. I'm not sure if the curtain was pulled around or whether we actually saw the physio taking place. Um, and we also get you to um, complete um, an event sheet for us which brings us on to one of our last slides. So this, this sheet on this left-hand side of the screen, we leave you with an event sheet for you to complete. Now, I know you've got a million and one things to do as part of your nursing duties on, um, on the unit, but it's really useful for us to know when there are occasions where you're doing cares, suctioning, boluses of medication is especially important to uh, write down for us. So we get you to, uh, there's a, a column for time here, um, a description of the event and then just to initial. So anything like suctioning, you know, take the time from the bottom right hand corner of the CFAM, the time is always displayed there and just explain what you've done. So, you know, whether it's checking pupils, suctioning, if physio have arrived and they're doing their um, their things, um, if you give a bolus of sedation, that's particularly important. Um, then we know that there might be changes on the CFAM. And if you notice any events that are in question, so any twitching, jerking, um, any changes in blood pressure or heart rate, um, and you know, the, the queries for us putting the CFAM on, um, then that's really, really useful. Thank you. Um, I said we come up twice a day to uh, report um, on the CFAM. This is the report that we generate and it gets put in a red folder on the back of the CFAM. Usually the only thing um, that your uh, medical staff will be interested in is this box at the top of the form. And we basically have like a, a tick box for what it's been shown. So we'll write down the time period that we've reviewed from and to, and then we'll tell you whether there has been a continuous trace, 
whether it's discontinuous, showing burst suppression or total suppression, and whether there's been any seizures in that uh, time period, whether there's been any changes associated with ICP. And we'll literally go yes or no. Uh, we've got a box that will tick if uh, we think that the findings are a little bit in, unclear or if we think they're beyond our level of reporting, um, then we'll um, suggest an EEG as well. And for our benefit, we write down medications just so that we can see um, any changes that might um, affect the CFAM. And we write down a brief factual description in kind of neurophysiology speak um, as to what it's been showing. And that's useful for us when we're sort of handing over to each other between each check. Um, and also if neurologists come on board and want to, um, you know, if they're familiar with neurophysiology and, um, and EEG changes, then it's useful uh, for them to sometimes just have a, a little bit of a read as well. So just to recap, this is our continuous trace. This is our burst suppression. So we've got a nice, a nice wide uh, band. This is our complete suppression. And these are our seizures. And so these are the four main trends that you are likely to come across. I'm sorry I can't be with you today, but thank you for listening to this presentation. If you've got any queries, um, anything that you uh, want to ask when we're up on the unit, then we're always um, happy to have a little bit of a chat with you. So, yes, thank you very much. Thank you.